Morning, everybody. This is an Essence session. Essence is a raw black. By the end of this session, you're going to actually have some doubts about the number one provider of information in the whole world. So we'll go through that. You'll know the process of what it takes to do a raw black. And then you'll have some understanding of why more people in Yunnan drink raw black as opposed to the process, completely processed black teas. So before we start down this road, first off, I have to thank all of you who brought gifts by this last week or so. Just some fabulous, wonderful gifts have actually really blown us away. Thank you all very much. It's been just surprising and spectacular. Secondly, let's talk about some stuff that happened this last week. So last Sunday, a gentleman and an entourage come in. The gentleman is somewhat unhappy. I'm not unhappy as much as sad. That's what I really mean. And he's Chinese. And so in the beginning, and a first timer. Okay, so all of those, things, but brought by a friend of the shop. So looks around and doesn't recognize too much and then starts asking a few questions and then asks some more questions. And it turns out it was really hard for him in the beginning to express what he wanted. But at the end of the day, it was a tea to make him fall into meditation. So after wandering around a few tries, we ended up with an ancient tree tea, which he enjoyed and his entourage who ordered their teas enjoyed immensely. Then he comes back up and remember, this is somebody born in China, raised in China, speaks Chinese, speaks English pretty well. And they start talking to the tea master because it's clear that dealing with the understudy, you're probably gonna get understudy answers. So let's deal with the tea master. And the person is saying something to the effect that, in Chinese, by the way, that, oh, I love cliff teas. I love cliff teas. Now, why didn't that gentleman lead with that at the beginning when he walked into the shop? Well, language matters, doesn't it? All of you know this. So when you say a cliff tea, is this a tea? Is this not a tea? that comes from the Wui Mountains, Fujian province. This is where cliff teas, rock teas come from. So, you know, I'm listening on the side and Xiaobei is trying to politely guide the conversation because we're trying to satisfy this customer, trying to get him a little bit happier and falling into good meditation practice and rhythm all of those very important things. And so then she follows up and so Cliff T, you're looking for in the mountain or what, what's your experience? And so this is like a debriefing. The guy says, I work with a tea master in Sichuan. Oh, okay. And again, what does this have to do with cliff teas? Well, this tea slash meditation master taught me I can take leaves and you don't need a lot and you brew them up and you can imagine yourself drinking a cliff tea. Now, I don't know about any of you. I'd say I have a pretty hard time imagining myself into a cliff tea, 
drinking a few miscellaneous tea leaves. And so a further conversation ensues where the tea master helps the gentleman understand language has consequences. Cliff tea is not Sichuan. Cliff tea isn't a few miscellaneous tea leaves. Cliff tea is from Fujian province. But that's not all. This conversation further went forward. And part of the conversation was, well, I really miss green tea from Sichuan. And so again, very polite, very careful. Well, we have green tea from Sichuan. And he says, well, I'm sure you don't have what it is that I miss. And so the tea master says, again, what is it you're missing? And he utters out a phrase and she says, wait here. And then she goes into the back, two minutes later comes out and says, smell this. Now, all of you know that have come into the shop that there is no crime allowed. We had to make an exception in this case because the gentleman smelt the leaves, uttered an expletive. Now, this was an expletive in happiness and surprise. And then I'm looking over there and a tear is rolling down his face. He was so moved because he says, even in China, it doesn't matter how much money you have. This isn't a money issue. There just isn't that much of this particular green tea. And you have it. And I recognize it. So right away, of course, he bought some. And I think that changed his whole mindset. Wasn't as sad at all. And he will be back. By the way, what is the name of this? particular green tea that we have. We don't have much of it here, but it's actually on the board and it's called heirloom. And a few of you have had it. So it is very unusual, very unique. And his explanation is just right. You can have all the money you want in China. If you don't get into that first, first pick, you won't get it because that's how little of it is made. All right, so that was the interesting thing that happened in the shop this week. Yeah, we always have interesting things every week, but that one rose to the top. So let's talk, let's shift gears and go to the number one authority in the world on everything. Let's see, not Wikipedia, oh, the internet, okay. And if you look on the internet, when they talk about Raw Black, they give a very confusing history because they say it started over almost 2000 years ago. Now, all of you, because you've been with us for so long, you're confused just as I was confused, as for fun, I was looking at the internet and seeing this repeated in explanation after explanation after explanation. They followed up this explanation with, well, the term poor, P-U-E-R, sometimes seen as P-U-E-R-H, comes from a location name in Yunnan province. Now that part is true. That part is real true. But the part that says that this process actually started in the Eastern Han Dynasty some 2000 years ago, where's your evidence? Show me. Most of these sites also further add that these come in tea cakes. So what's happened here, which is really unfortunate because 
for most of the tea drinking world in, who speaks English and they look at this, they will come to a tea shop. Oh yeah, I want this tea that's been around for a couple thousand years. The process has been around for a couple thousand years. And I'm sure that I'm right because it says so. And it says so many, many times on this purveyor of true information. The only issue is that the people who write up these descriptions, and by the way, here's how I really think this happened. Now, this is conjecture. This isn't facts. I'm conjecturing them. My conjecture is that one person many years ago wrote up a description. They may have actually known origin and provenance and so forth but they wrote it so unclearly that people who followed didn't understand that what they meant was, yes, there were tea cakes already a couple thousand years ago being made. No, it wasn't poor. And yes, in the city or county of poor, there was tea being collected and put into cakes. But what type of tea was it? Oh, okay, before we ask that question, let's clear our heads about something. Poor is true black tea. And in China, they, saw, they say, hey, Cha, black tea. This is confusing to everybody who speaks English because black tea, as we all we're led to believe pre-Sophies is fully oxidized tea. Poor is fermented tea. You have raw poor, which is just starting the fermentation process. And then you have ripe or cooked poor, which is in quotes, fully fermented. And the Chinese have always been confused by how Westerners handle their language. So these years, they have suggested another way of referring to black tea. They've stretched the word hay, which truly means black, and now dark tea. So you'll see some places, yeah, we have dark tea. And we have black tea, meaning that they have red tea. And so you get this whole conversation where the colors and the rainbow are all mixed up. Let's see, a rainbow with a dark stripe. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. But this is the source of all this confusion. And it's further confused by the fact that though there were tea cakes that were being made, primitive tea cakes that were being made 2000 years ago, they weren't being processed in a manner that suggested fermented. They were being processed as unoxidized tea leaves, green tea, in other words. No indication no documentary indication otherwise exists right now. Maybe there were people who were thousands of years ahead of their time, but we don't have any documentary evidence to support that notion. And hence, all of this confusion about black tea and fermented tea and when did it start, arose from that. So then I ask you the following question. Does anybody in the whole wide world really able, are they really able to tell you within five years, within 10 years, hey, let's, let's be generous, within a hundred years of when fermented tea process started? If they tell you that they can, LCS is my response. Impossible. We don't have documentary evidence. And in the absence of that, 
you have to assume, just as I have to assume, that it was green tea every day all the way until the 14th century or the 15th century. Is it possible, by the way, and it's, it's talk generally speaking, is it possible that by accident, something fermented 2000 years ago on a long journey? It's possible, but was that the process that they were going? Was it intentional to have fermented tea 2000 years ago? And the answer is, as far as anybody knows, no. All right, so now we've taken care of that question. So let's get into the essence. Oh, a pun, actually. Let's get to the center of a description of what raw black versus fully fermented black is. And let's make this fairly fast because Tea Master already has thirsty signs coming from her eyes. So raw black is the following. You pick leaves, tea leaves, obviously. You bring them in and you wither them. That is, you spread them on the ground, usually outside. Sun dry. Why? Because you're trying to reduce the moisture content significantly. Why do you want to reduce the moisture content? Because if you don't, you can't play with the leaves. You cannot manipulate the leaves. You can't roll them. They'll fall apart. You do that. And so don't ask me yet for how long, because by farm, by area, by custom, it's all different. And then at some point as a farmer, you decide, okay, these are done enough. I'm out fried. Now, so far, this doesn't sound all that different than green tea. Now, green tea, you might get from the pick to the fry much faster than they do in Yunnan. And by the way, that's where I am. I forgot to tell you where I am this morning. I'm in Yunnan. Yunnan is Southwest China. And essence comes from the Ailao Mountains in Yunnan. And Ailao Mountains are about 150 miles north of the Burmese border. So now you're perfectly centered. So after you fry, oh, and by the way, if you're frying green tea and you're frying raw black, are you frying at the same temperature? Generally not. The green tea frying much hotter, much hotter. So we're talking between three and 500 degrees. For the raw black, we're talking about 180, 190, maybe up to 250. Okay, I see a difference there. How about time-wise? Is it the same amount of time? No. Raw black is being fried fairly quickly. So what does fairly quickly mean? Less than an hour. That's good. Usually somewhere between five to 12 minutes. How about green tea? Are we frying that less than an hour? Always. Are we frying at five minutes? Never. How long are we frying green tea? usually somewhere around 20 minutes, somewhere around that, and we're frying it much hotter. So that's a difference right there. And we'll talk about why that exists in a minute. So let's move to the next step. After we fry, we take it out of the pan. In green tea case, if you want to roll and fry at the same time, you can. Under what circumstance is this true? It's true when you have a bud-only tea. Uh, let me think here. Do we have any bud-only teas that you might know of? Oh, we do. Dragon well. Dragon well is a prime example of frying and rolling 
And rolling here simply means shaping the tea leaf. When you're a raw black, are you going to fry and roll at the same time? The answer is no. Rolling is a whole, always separate process. Why might that be? It's because in the pick itself, it's always down to the third or fourth leaf. You may not, for most fried, I'm sorry, for most raw blacks, you may not have much of a bud left. You really, the bud is mostly open and all the leaves are mostly open. That's the pick you're getting. And that's why it's different. So after you fry with a green tea, like I said, you get out of the pan quickly. If it's not a bud tea, you might roll it. You want it to look beautiful or you want it to look some way. And then basically you bake it. This is a green tea now. You bake it to reduce the moisture down to less than 6%. Why again do you want moisture less than 6%? Because you don't want it to mold. Now let's see here. What are they doing with the raw black that's different? Always, no exceptions, roll. So you're rolling the tea, rolling, rolling, rolling. And it's on a bamboo, a cross-hatched, flat container. And it's not even a container, flat apparatus. And you're rolling and don't look at my hand motions because those are all false. Those are our Western hand motion. Think artfully, just rolling artfully and you want a certain result. I'm unable to produce that result. I've tried and everybody at the places where I try says, oh, that looks great. That's wonderful. And then as soon as I leave the area, the guy outside says, he's gone. You can get rid of that stuff now. Because it's not artful. And I myself, when I look at what the experienced rollers do, and when I look at what I do, it's like, hmm, that's not very artful. That's not very good. And it's more than art, by the way. It really is about an end result that they're trying to get with the rolling. So they're trying to break down the cells of the plant in a certain way to get those volatiles and to get the essences of the plant on the leaf. So after they roll, what do they do? Oh, they apply heat. Well, wait a minute. Don't they apply heat with green tea? Now, what did I say about the green tea? I said they bake. You know what I left out? And all of you, you caught me. Very good. They bake where? In an oven. With the poor, the raw black, are they baking in the oven? Absolutely not. <clears throat> no circumstance. They are baking the tea, but they're baking it under the sun. So that's the main difference. Why do they do sun baking? Is that to give it more of an organic feel, to be more modern? Is that what's really going on here? Answer to that is no. What they're trying to do is wake up the microorganisms from the forest that were originally on the leaf. And by the way, essence is picked from tea trees that are anywhere from about 1,200 to 1,500 years old. So it's ancient but it's not the 2,000 to 3,000 year old. So all of these forests have microorganisms living within them. And so when they initially fried, remember they fried for a relatively short time, those microorganisms, oh, it's getting hot in here. I better go into stasis. They go into stasis. And then at this last step, when you bake, when you sunbake, hey, this is the temp I like. It's like going to Hawaii. So they come awake, they're really happy, and they start their work of fermentation. Now, 
This is in quotes, loose leaf, finished raw black. And it's finished only in so far as it's ready to go to the next stage. What is the next stage? The next stage is to wait for X number of years while those microorganisms go to work. By the way, somewhere around year four or five, oxidation starts to go to work and it overtakes the microorganisms. So you got both things going back and forth, changing the nature of the flavor, the look and feel in the tea liquor. Traditionally, when you compressed, steamed and compressed those leaves, at the end of the sunbake process and made a cake out of it, those would take anywhere from 30 to 70 years to become, in quotes, fully fermented. Finished, right? For the loose leaf, it's gonna be faster because everything's exposed to oxygen. So you got oxidation working much faster. How much faster? Do I have a number that you can take and post on Wikipedia? The answer is no, because we here really don't know. And we're doing an experiment here to see how long it takes to get into that, in quotes, finished, fully finished, fully fermented state. We're estimating 15 to 20 years, but we don't know. And all of you are going on this experiment with us because we're saving some of each of these raw blacks to see how long we take to become fully fermented. So that's the basic process of how you get raw black. Now, all of you are really thirsty because I've talked almost halfway. Therefore, let's get the team master up here. Let's have her bring law and order to this raw black arena, brew it up, and then you brew with her. So it gives me great pleasure to have the tea master Shabe come here. I'm so surprised. <laughs> yeah. So today, so we do raw black from Isle Mountain. So oh, this is my another tea bar, huh? everybody at staff, with my staff. <laughs> with my staff. So, so this is the tableau. You notice she has three empty cups. The reason she has three empty cups is to speed up the dissipation of steam to lower the temperature faster. This is 175 degrees steep, but it's also something that you want to dissipate the steam if you can. you'll get a better flavor is really what I mean by that. So she's going through the process, making sure that the cups are absolutely clean. She's using actually a somewhat higher temperature. You see a tea toy right here, strainer, and then a small pot. Now that's the Yixing pot. Would you ever use an Yixin pot to make a raw black? And the answer is, generally speaking, no. Do they in Yunnan use Yixin pots to make raw black? The answer is emphatically no. However, and this is important because somebody from China might say to you, oh yes, we use Yixing pots to do dark tea. What type of dark tea? What they mean is fully fermented. So some people, and it's mostly not Yunnan, by the way, it's mostly outside of Yunnan, use Yixing pots to do fully, uh, to brew fully fermented tea, mostly outside of Yunnan. Yunnan uses Gaiwa. They use the covered cup technique by and large to brew both the raw black and the fully fermented. You just said 175 degree water, but the email says 170 degrees. Did we mishear you? Uh, 
thank you for giving me credit for you mishearing. No, I made a mistake. Whatever the email said, that's no mistake because the team master regulates everything that leaves here. What the team master cannot regulate is what falls out of my mouth. So that was a mistake. What's in the email is correct. All right, so the team master is taking the tea leaves of essence, putting them in the glass, shaking them up. Making sure that it's essence that she has. And is adding the water. Notice on the sides, not directly on as much as possible. Timer is set for two minutes. Just a very beautiful. Raw black is almost always very beautiful because when it's done in a non-machine form, you get all of these very long leaves, some standing, some at the top. You, in this particular area, in the Highland Mountains, occasionally a stem will be in there, not very often, but occasionally it'll be a stem in there. And that adds a little bit to the punch of the flavor, just very beautiful. All right, so I got you all the way through to the end of the process, essentially the end of the process of raw black. So one thing I didn't spend much time on because that's not the case with this one is the final two steps can be a steaming and then a compression into a cake. But essentially, all the processing is done by the end of the time that it's sun baked. So why in the world do producers from other areas in Yunnan go and visit farms and then actually buy some of the stuff from the variety, various farms? They're going because every micro terrar produces a different flavor. And in some cases, what they'll do, especially the big producers, will be to use that particular flavor from that terrar and blend it with other terrars to create a cake. And they're all, always doing it for cakes. It's not loose leaf. Right? Loose leaf, you will almost never, ever see a blend. Okay, timer is going off. Tea master is going to separate the tea liquor from the tea leaves. Not in a huge hurry. Just trying to make sure it's carefully done. Okay. So first thing to note is look at that color. So some of these turn out to be much yellower, some turn out to be greener. So depending on the micro terroir and depending on the producer, you're gonna get some differences in color. First thing you should be doing once it's your turn to brew is to look at these leaves and smell them. And remember, this is 170 degrees, so you can actually get your nose down in here and really get a sense, a starting opening sense of what this might be like. We then enter the quality arena by taking a 170 degree inhalation. Actually, it's a sip rather than an inhalation. You can take more and cover your tongue. And remember, in the quality arena, we're looking for mouthfeel, astringency, aftertaste, and energetics. So that's the first sip. 
and I'm thinking about what it is that I'm feeling, the second sip goes further because you want now to add to that quality arena and get a sense of flavor and aroma. Okay, it's your turn to brew. Again, set up your tableau similar to this, whether you use just two cups or three cups, it doesn't matter. Either way is gonna be okay. And I told you that with loose leaf, it's never a blend. Only with the case, occasionally do you get blends. And those are specialty items that big time producers will make because they'll take tea from famous areas and blend it. And then present that as a special blend out to the market. By the way, we don't do that here. We don't have any of the raw black blends. We get the straight up. And most of ours is loose leaf, although we do have a few cakes again unblended. Blended single leaf, same tree, same location. Same location, not same tree, because, well, that's a really great question. I answered it way too fast. So when you go to the king tree, and that's the one that's usually old, oldest within a grove, sometimes they'll actually make a cake or a batch of loose leaf specifically from that tree. So we actually do have some loose leaf in here from king trees in one of the areas that's very close to the Burmese border. Very expensive, very hard to come by. You have to go to the farms. You will not get this if you don't go to the farms. The producers who pick this up and who really want it, they almost always are blending it with other king leaf trees, or they have some queen trees in some areas, and they're making those type of blends. But for the most part, and especially here at the shop for the most part. The, the, uh, what we're talking about is the village, not the region, the village. All right, so you're gonna put your tea leaves in the heated glass. You're gonna set your timer to two minutes. Carefully add the water. Hit the timer, two minutes. First thing you're gonna do is look at how beautiful this looks as it's brewing. Just a wonderful aesthetic to this. And then we're gonna go back to this sense of what tools to use. So usually they're using a guy wire, never an Ishin pot for raw black. For fully fermented, as I said, in some other areas, but normally not in Yunnan, you'll see an Yishin. So I ask you the following question. What do you imagine most of the local population drinks? The raw black or the fully fermented? So in our experience, all the places we go to, it's almost always the raw black. Why is this? It's for several reasons. If you appreciate, if you're an aficionado, you're looking for these wider range of flavors that the raw black has. 
the fully fermented are usually in a little bit narrower range with earthiness and loaminess, especially for good fully fermented as the top flavors. Occasionally, we have one here that's woodsy. So you have that also as a possibility. But by and large, especially those in the know, they're drinking, they tend to be drinking the raw black. Why is this? One of the reasons is the chemical constituents. Raw black is close to green tea. So you're getting lots of cabbages. You're getting a full polyphenol profile, similar to green tea. Timer has gone off, by the way. You're separating the tea leaves from the tea liquor. One of the participants notes, it just makes a beautiful mini kelp forest in clothes that can only be seen with steeping in glass. Oh, wonderful comment. This commentator says, Viva Kelp Forest. It looks like a kelp forest. It is, especially when you brew in a glass, you can get that full feeling of being in a kelp forest. Great comment. That's true. And I love the aesthetic of this. So take your time while you're going through the quality arena and trying to determine what uh, you're tasting. And I'll continue with the chemical constituents. Ah, yes. Very soft mouthfeel, a light umami with a vegetal base and then a hint of spice. Light umami, vegetal base, hint of spice. And soft mouthfeel and a soft mouth feel. You've captured a lot of what this is already. And part of what you're tasting or part of what you're expressing, especially by using soft mouth feel. Two things go into soft mouth feel. One is age. The second is whether it's ancient or brand new. And brand new being a relative term, under 100 years old. If the leaves are under 100 years old, it takes a very long time to get to a soft mouthfeel. If they're ancient, you get to a soft mouthfeel very, very quickly. Yes. Another participant finds that the warm leaves had a smooth malt scent, but the steep leaves had the vegetal, floral, light malt, scent is round not ah so the steep leaves the scent is round there is a soft floralness to it and just a hint of malt whereas in the dry leaves the malt is more apparent and i really like that you're going through this with this type of care because you're seeing the range of what's possible in this tea and you're expressing it in a way that if you weren't brewing it yourself you'd have no idea yes how old are these trees again hey babe uh oh the trees Jeez. ah the trees are between 1200 and 1500 years old the so we're still talking about people in yunnan who are drinking they tend to drink the raw over the fully fermented. Scientists do that because they're trying to get more of the green tea essence. However, from a health benefit standpoint, both the raw and the fully fermented have different apparent health benefits. And I think that these days there's more it's beginning to be more understanding of what the fully fermented actually bring to the table. And there's not in the West, it, it's exactly backwards. In the West, there appears to be much more appreciation for the fully fermented, almost no understanding or appreciation of the raw black. In China, it's the other way around. It's very common to be served the raw black and be honored with that, so to speak, and 
because the flavor profiles are so different by micro terrar, this is more interesting to the Chinese. So it, it's, it's a real contrast when you get here versus in China. And it, it's fascinating. And the Chinese are now beginning to really, really dig deep down into the fully fermented. But here, what you get for some reason is you get herbal practitioners, chiropractors many times, thinking that the fully fermented is just full of all of this magical stuff. The way I would respond to that is both are full of magical stuff and the stuff transforms. Okay, let's stop using stuff, that's horrible. The chemical constituents transform between the raw and the fully fermented. The tea is very drinkable. It's warming, not very drying, and it's got a light mouthfeel. Tea is fully drinkable. Love this expression. Warming in terms of a feeling, not very drying, which is a great description. It, it is just short of juicy. One of the reasons we like this one a lot. So some of the, just to draw more of a picture for you, so some of the ancient tree is much more potent in terms of flavor and astring astringency. So it really does depend on the micro terrar because all these micro terrars, one of the main differences is pH levels. So the pH level for tea really works well between 4.2 and about 5.4, something in that range. Closer to 4.2 seems to be more potent. Closer to the 5.4, you have less of that impression in your mouth. Yes. One of the participants says his appreciation for the tea has increased over time. And he observes the tea being the same means that he has changed since he first tasted it. Oh, great comment. And all of us have changed since we first tasted the tea. This commentator notes that he's appreciating this tea more over time and notes that that appreciation is a change in him. Tell you the truth, I underwent the same thing because in the beginning, I just didn't really understand this stuff very much. And by spending so much time in Yunnan and spending so much time at the villages and time after time being exposed to different flavors, different astringencies with these, I began to appreciate them in a way that I never did before. In fact, I will tell you this, 20 years ago, if you'd asked me about Pura, I would have only been able to respond about the fully fermented. I didn't, to tell you the truth, really like the fully fermented very much. And worse than that, I was only exposed to a very thin segment of what fully fermented was. And it was the Chinatown restaurant experience rather than the full experience of seeing what the range is. And now I have a much different, much, much different understanding both of the fully and the raw black. And again, it's me who's changed. This stuff was always available. I just never was exposed. Uh, one of the participants says she's not sure how this can be, but she's finding this both tea, both robust and delicate. And that's an interesting and delightful experience for her. So this commentator talks about robust and delicate uh, in this tea and is having a hard time putting her arms around that because that seems like a contradiction. But I get this statement because so many of the raw blacks have both of that. 
And I think sometimes when we talk about delicate, we're really referring to mouth feel. When we talk about the robustness, we're usually talking about the flavor. And so you can have both at the same time. And I truly get that, especially with the raw blacks. I don't get normally that same range with the fully fermented, but with these, I absolutely get that. So you might be thinking to yourselves, what will happen in 20 years, or let's say 30 years to this tea? How will it look and how will it taste? Well, Xiaobei and I have both had the pleasure and honor of being guests in a place where they got out. It wasn't loose leaf, but it was caked raw black that was north of 50 years old. Not much north, but just around 50 years old. And the color, so you know when you get some of the fully fermented, they're truly black and deep black. But the color of the 50-year-old one was brownish with a little bit of tinge of red in it. And you really didn't get that heavy black. You didn't get real, really black at all, to tell you the truth, brown and red. And when you tasted it, this thing about mellowness and mouthfeel, it was evident right away. And you had more range of flavor than you normally would get in a fully fermented tea. So the fully fermented teas by and large are done industrially. So the largest plants produce 40 to 60,000 pounds of that every year. Most of it gets exported to Russia, the Middle East, Tibet. A lot of places drink it because at the industrial level, it's not very expensive and therefore in those areas, many times they put other things in it, spices and so forth. Africa, North Africa, a lot of this tea, tea goes to as well. And for aficionados, particularly in southern China, uh, Canton province, Hong Kong, Macau, when they drink it, they're drinking, again, mostly the fully fermented. You're not getting so much of this delicate and interesting raw black. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a difference. And that flavor is more uniform than the stuff that's been naturally fermented over the 50 years or so. When you said spices, like in, you said North Africa, is that being added to a raw black or, or a fully fermented? Never to a raw black. The spices are never added to a raw black. It's always to a fully fermented. First off, even though raw black undergoes less apparent processing than a fully fermented, I ask you this, what is the main cost of dealing with a raw black? And it really is the storage. Because if you don't store it properly, it loses its value, it loses its taste. If you store it properly, the taste will just get better and better. When you have a fully fermented tea, remembering that this is like a composted tea, it's a process that takes 45 to 60 days. Now that part of the process is the expensive part of the process. But after the cakes are made, all you gotta do is ship them. And yes, you should store them in an area that doesn't have other aromas, but you don't need the same care as you do with a raw black. And so therefore the equation changes quickly. In the very beginning, the fully fermented is more expensive. As you go over time, the raw black is much more expensive. So the 50-year-old cake we had, that thing, probably $100,000 for that cake. Because first off, not that many exist. And then second off, to have been stored correctly all of those years, 
was an expense. And if it was not stored correctly, it wouldn't have been any good. So hence a kind of a warning to all of you. And that is, if somebody says, hey, look, I got this, this raw black, it's 30 years old. Would you like to give me $5,000 for this? The first thought should be, especially if it's here in the West, no, thank you. That's the first thought. The second thing you should ask is, where was it stored? Now, if it's stored in underground caves, like the gentleman in Marin County's stuff is stored, then the possibility of that still being good is quite high, quite high. And that's probably a great deal. But most of the time, so before we went to China in 2019, I had a young gentleman who called me from Stockton. And he said he had a cake from the 1980s. Uh, he said, I don't really drink this stuff. My grandma passed away. Would you like to buy it? And I said, well, give me the details and give me the storage details. He wasn't able to provide me much information on the storage details. So the answer was right away, I can't buy that. And I won't buy it. And I tried to link him up. I didn't try to. I did link him up with people in China who I thought might be interested because the Chinese are really connoisseurs with this. Here in the West, not so much. And again, when they were unable to ascertain the storage conditions in a way that was satisfactory or believable to them, they had no interest. So this is why the raw black ends up being so expensive and so prized. And that's what people are really, really looking at when they're purchasing raw, uh, rare raw blacks. All right, so we started this session, by the way, since this is uh, happy holidays to everybody, we're, we're, we thought for this end of year session, this set, that we do three very nice teas. And we started off with essence. Next week, we're gonna do Rhapsody, which is a red tea. Very, very interesting, very nice. We'll go through that. And then the last session will be the first session of the new year. Now, remembering, of course, that this year has not been a, a friendly year. This has been a hard year for everybody. COVID, Ukraine, zero COVID, inflation. I mean, the list goes on and on. All bad stuff. This next year is going to be better. And we thought we'd welcome it in with ferocious. So we're going to do yet another cliff team. First session in 2023. Truly, we hope everybody stays healthy during this time. We hope if you're traveling or about to travel that you do so safely. We look forward to seeing everybody next week. Have a great week. You take care now. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.